Good afternoon. My name is Vivek Datta and I'm a Frank Knox Fellow and MPH candidate in Family and Community Health here at the Harvard School of Public Health. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you today our guest all the way from across the pond, Lord Nigel Crisp. Lord Crisp is an independent crossbencher in the House of Lords where he speaks mainly on issues of international health and development. Lord Crisp was Chief Executive of the National Health Service in England between 2000 and 2006 and Permanent Secretary at the UK Department of Health. The National Health Service is the largest health organization in the world and it is an organization that I know well both as a patient and as a physician. During his tenure, Lord Crisp oversaw some of the most ambitious changes to the NHS since its inception in 1948, as well as seeing public satisfaction with the health service double in this period. He describes this and other successes and failures of these reforms in his most recent offering, 24 Hours to Save the NHS. His earlier book, Turning the World Upside Down, The Search for Global Health in the 21st Century, takes further the idea about mutual learning between rich and poor countries that he developed in his 2007 report for the Prime Minister, Global Health Partnerships. Lord Crisp chairs Sightsavers International and is a senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a distinguished visiting fellow here at the Harvard School of Public Health, an honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and an honorary fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge. Please join me in welcoming Lord Nigel Crisp. Now we'll turn over to Professor Lehman. Thank you, Vivek, for that lovely introduction. And that, thing, I think, gives you a sense of the span of work, the thoughtful engagement, uh, and the serious committed leadership that Lord Crisp has evinced in his career to date. I know there are many things that lie ahead for him to be doing on our behalf. But he has taken this time to come and talk with us about his uh, life and work in domestic and international health care uh, and his insights about uh, these experiences, particularly since this life and work has, as we've just heard, uh, been primarily as a very senior leader, a chief executive, a major visionary and strategist on some of the most complex topics that we are studying here at the School of Public Health and that the world faces and actually needs to resolve in the next century, the one we are now in. Uh, the questions I would um, begin uh, to pose for Lord Crisp um, are ones that you uh, almost immediately will have at the top of um, your mind as well. And uh, I will invite you um, in the course of this time to ask questions yourself, which I think he will find particularly engaging. But if I could uh, begin, Lord Crisp, by uh, acknowledging that um, you have many things you might wish to say about leadership. And I will be asking you um, in the course of this time about the various ways you have learned leadership in, in the, in the mm -hmm. life you have chosen. Um, and I would begin with the National Health Service, since that is um, a topic that we study. Uh, it is very complicated. Uh, we respect it greatly. Uh, from this side of the pond. Um, we are aware that the United States is struggling with all the issues that the NHS has struggled with and to some extent um, resolved with more clarity than we have to date. Uh, and yet it's also, even, in, even now, being battered by a range of criticism. And I think that it would be very helpful if you could explain to us um, why the urgency that Tony Blair had about the NHS in 2000 um, when he asked you to take this over. Why this urgency that there's 24 hours to save the NHS? Explain the title of this great okay. new book. And then say, if you could, what it looked like in 2000 when you came to the helm of NHS. What did you see as the range of challenges that were actually now suddenly for you to address? Right. Ch shall I start off by doing that, and then, then I've got a few remarks about leadership and particularly about yes. decision making. Shall I go on into, in, in, into, talking, about, into talking about that? You, you can start either way you would like. Right. Well, let, let's start with the, with the NHS and your, your NHS point. Uh, this book is called 24 Hours to Save the NHS, and the very simple reason for that is that in, on presumably April the 30th, um, 1997, 
uh, Tony Blair as a, as a would-be Prime Minister, uh, said to the British public, you've got 24 hours to save the NHS. You can vote Labour and save the NHS, or you can vote Conservative and it will carry on disappearing. Uh, and well, I'm, I'm an independent member of the House of Lords. I'm, I'm not a, a politician. Um, but it's certainly true that by the late 90s, the NHS was in pretty near, it felt like terminal decline. Um, really interesting. You can trace us against France. We tend to compare ourselves with France um, uh, in, in lots of ways. Um, and we were spending the same amount 20 years before that. By then, we were spending 6.7% of GDP. They were spending about 9.5% of GDP. And you could see the sort of attrition that was taking the NHS down to a point where it was you know, dreadful waiting list. If, if, if a colleague here had worked in A&E in 1997, um, you'd have often found it like a battlefield. Um, it was a really difficult position. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was at that point that, and I'm going to come on to this in talking about decision making, uh, that um, Blair and the Labour government made a big bet. Uh, they actually invested very heavily in the NHS and they made it one of the, uh, the cornerstone issues for their government and their government's success. Um, so it was a really significant moment. And my very simple picture of it is I think between 2000 and about 2009, we saved the NHS, we got it back on track. But it's not sustainable. The second half st is still to come. And the second half uh, uh, of what the NHS needs to do, unfortunately, the current government isn't doing. <laughs> um, but what it needs to do is to make that shift from a hospital and doctor-based service to a community and people-based service in response to the change in epidemiology, which everyone in this room knows better than I do. It needs another big shift, and, and that's yet to come. That's the next instalment. Let, let me talk a bit about leadership and, and, and decision-making and, and, and sort of unpack some of that, because I think that's the, the, the theme of, uh, of, of, of your event here. First thing I wanted to say, in talking about decision-making, of course, when you're the leader, of course decision-making is important, but actually you need to get other people to make decisions. And I have seen many people failing because they draw all the decisions up to the top. Um, and actually, if you think about it, when you're operating at this level and you get promoted up to this level, people still ask you to make the decisions you were making at the level one down. And you're comfortable to do it because it's in your comfort zone. Um, but actually, when you're up at the, the next level up, you should be doing only the stuff that you need to be doing. And therefore, it's quite clear that, you know, um, uh, that for, for leaders, um, and particularly very big organisations, actually don't actually make terribly many decisions. You know? My job as leader was to make sure we set a direction, was to appoint the right people and give them space to carry on, and then, of course, to challenge them. But, you know, you're not the bright, you, you may be the leader, but you're not the brightest person in the organisation. You certainly don't know everything else that's going on. And if you're running the health service, what do I know about mental health? You know? Uh, and actually, I need people to be thinking and making those decisions. And I need a method of making sure that I'm confident that those are as good a decisions as being made. So decision-making is quite an interesting art when you're at that, uh, at that senior level. Let me give you two examples from, from my time as a chief executive of a hospital, and then let me move into the political arena. Does that seem like a, mm -hmm. a, a fair, fair way to go? Um, when I was chief executive, I was chief executive of the Oxford Radcliffe Hospital, which is the John Radcliffe and the Churchill, if people will, 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 will know of it. Uh, um, it's a very, very famous and esteemed hospital. Yeah. I, I one of think, the best. Yeah, I always think Oxford and Harvard, I think, think of themselves as, uh, have, have some of yeah. the, I used to joke that um, with my friends there that they thought themselves as a centre of excellence, but of course they were really a centre of arrogance. <laughs> uh, you, you may recognise some of that. In, uh, 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 yes, yeah. <clears throat> you, you might want to take that clip out. <laughs> <laughs> but... but um, Oxford, great place, great place to work. Let me give you two examples of decisions I took as chief executive. All these very smart people. One was one of the nicest decisions a chief executive ever come, I, I, I ever have. I had a trauma surgeon come to me and he said, Nigel, I want to change our trauma service. I know the evidence. The evidence is that uh, at the moment in the NHS, um, the sickest people are seen by the most junior staff. Yeah. You turn up at the middle of the night and you're seen by a junior and you won't see the consultant till, or the attending. Uh, till the middle of the next morning or something of that sort. We're going to change it. We want to change it so that we've got the consultant there 24 hours a day. Live in the hospital, awake. First person you see is a consultant if you're a trauma patient. And I said, OK, Keith. <laughs> um, and he came to me with this whole plan. And my decision was to back him, was to actually test him out and to back him and then to give him air cover, if that makes sense. Um, because actually the other doctors in the hospital hated it. 
You know, the trauma surgeons wanted to do this, but all the other doctors said, so is this the thin end of the wedge? Are you going to make us be in the hospital 24 hours a day? Um, also had some really interesting knock-on effects because the, the agreement was that they were in hospital for 24 hours and then they weren't allowed back in the hospital for the next 24 hours because they'd be dangerous, wouldn't they? Or potentially so. Um, and the consequence of that, of course, is that continuity of care passed to the nurses. So the only people who could discharge from the wards and trauma wards in, in the JR were nurses. Again, powers that be didn't like that. So you can imagine the sort of decision-making role for me was backing that and actually seeing where the fight was going to come from. Now, why did you, why did you know that was the right decision? Well, I think there were, the, 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 the were, it was interesting. One of the decisions, and I, I was going to go through a, a, a few different sorts of decisions, but this was one of those decisions where the evidence was very clear. You know? I think if you'd asked any doctor around to look at the evidence, they would have said the golden hour, the first hour for trauma, is, is really serious and significant. It was well established, but nobody did it. don't know how well you do it in the US, but actually in the, in the UK, basically, we still had the process that actually if you turned up um, in, in, in the middle of the night, you saw the junior person. You know? So the evidence was very clear there. And the other thing that was right for me is that he was going to, make, he was going to deal with it himself. You know? He was a leader who was going to make it happen. Right? And how many years into your tenure did this proposal come Two up? Two weeks. <laughs> um, and how well did you know Keith? Uh, I met him. <laughs> so On the other hand, in, let, there's let, something instinctive about how you assess well, people. Uh, let, 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 the, the, there is. You, you can know a good proposal. But I have to say, I also went and rang up the, uh, the Regis professor, who's the top professor, a man called David Weatherall, for some, some of them. And said, this bloke. Keith, is he any good? <laughs> you know, so you did get some cross-references. Let me tell you another story, though, about that hospital before we get onto the yep. politics, which is that about a year later, a GP came and saw me, and she got breast cancer, and she said, Nigel, you run an awful service in this hospital. Absolutely awful. Do you know what you do with women with breast cancer? You put them in with all the other general surgery patients, and they're there distressed um, for surgery, and they're stuck in with people who've, who've got you know, hernias and completely different sort of stuff. You should be taking them out of that. So I listened to that, uh, and it was a powerful and an emotive argument. And I took it to the surgeons and the others. And the nurses said, yeah, of course, she's absolutely right. And the surgeon said, well, that would be impossible, really, because actually you know, we've got our operating schedules, and we, we can't do it. You know, it, it won't work. Um, and the nurses I then ended up working with, and this was an example where I actually had to put my foot down, um, where the nurses and people actually pointed out that you could actually go into the operation in the Churchill Hospital as opposed to the JR Hospital, which is half a mile away. Um, and people didn't particularly want to do that because it did involve moving uh, across. But the surgeons and all took the view that actually, okay, maybe we should do that, all except for one individual. And in the end, I had to have him in my office and say, actually, we're going to do this, and you're either on board or you're off board. Um, and what was interesting there um, is that actually I got away with that because of passive resistance rather than active resistance. People knew that was the right decision and therefore it was acceptable for me as a manager to be taking that strong line and, uh, and pushing it. Because there's an issue here about context, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And in healthcare, there are so many powerful people. You know, decisions aren't clean cut as they are in some other places. You've got to take people with me. So on the one example, I had these clinicians leading the way um, uh, and wanting to make the change happen and I had to provide air cover and on this other one, I had to make the decisions and push it, um, and I wasn't opposed. And that was a really interesting point. And they're two very different sorts of decisions, but they're both the sort of decisions that I guess quite a lot of people in, in managerial jobs where you've got many stakeholders and many powerful people have to make it work. You must have seen that on an a extraordinarily larger scale when you came in to lead the NHS, that is, yeah. passive resistance or a clinician leader? I mean, did, did, did that pattern Well, it, it got much more complicated because, you know, as, as we've already said in that first bit, the, the context and power are very mm -hmm. important. You know, just because you're labelled chief executive, it doesn't mean to say you're powerful. You know, don't, don't be misled by titles. Um, you, you've actually got to work out where the power is and how you, and how you use it. Um, and of course, in government, you've then got politics at a, at a, at a major scale. And, and this was serious, heavy politics. As I've already said, uh, Mr. Blair had taken a bet on improving the NHS. I was a, they created a plan. I was appointed as, as chief executive to deliver it. I saw him every fortnight to see how it was going on. And of course, I wasn't a politician, but there were plenty of people who wanted me to fail. 
You know? I was into that political arena. I'm not like a political appointment as you, as you have in the, in the US. Um, and of course, I was also sucked into occasionally those inner, inter, inside government rows. And in the NHS, of course, that would be typically, and I'm not giving away any state secrets when I say number 10 in the person of Tony Blair and number 11 in the person of Gordon Brown, we're not always seeing eye to eye. Um, interestingly, in health terms, Tony Blair was interested in what patients wanted and Gordon Brown was interested in public health. And he was interested in child benefit and, and, and how you pull people out of poverty. Uh, and Tony Blair was interested in how you improved services uh, and, and, and reduced waiting times. Mm -hmm. So we were in that sort of, that sort of context. So let me, let me if, if this is going in the right direction. It is um, indeed. Uh, let me g g give, give, you, give you three, three quick illustrations of, 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 uh, of things. There are, there are decisions where I had to go along with, <laughs> which I didn't think were necessarily the right ones, but you'd make a trade-off, you know? Do you actually, you're not convinced this is the right way to go, but actually you probably have to do it. Mm -hmm. There were decisions I made where I had to persuade the politicians to be with me, and there were decisions where we made jointly, and where, in a sense, I think we had to create a sort of framework for making those decisions. Uh, because in that complicated situation, you've got masses of stakeholders, you've got, and, and all the powerful ones have access to the Prime Minister, you know? We took 8.5% out of the pharmacy budget, uh, sorry, out of the pharma, pharmaceutical company's prices. I, I, I hired an American and set him off to uh, take on the drug companies, and he took out 8.5% uh, of, the, of the budget, and the pharma companies came and complained to the Prime Minister, so we had to reduce it to 7.5%. Interesting, you know, you, you, you've, you've got that sort of circle. The senior doctors treat the prime minister, if you like, you know. I mean, doctors have this privileged access to power. So you've got a lot of stakeholders that you're looking at. Yep. Um, but let me give you the, the, the three examples. The first one where, where they had come into office with certain decisions they had made before they came into office, which in a sense I as chief executive had to implement. Um, and one of them was actually changing the consultant contract. Uh, which was quite interesting. There's been a long a, a row in the, in the UK about how consultants work in the NHS um, and that they needed to be paid in a different way because actually consultants working in the NHS were also allowed to do private practice and the Labour Party coming from their particular political spectrum wanted to sort that out because they thought that a number of people cheated on that, on, on, on that arrangement. Um, now, if I were trying to reform the NHS, the first thing I wouldn't have done was pick a fight with the doctors. No? It wouldn't have been on my strategic route. Um, uh, you know, I might have picked one a little bit further down the line, but I think I'd have got a bit, of, bit more on, on my uh, under the belt. But they didn't really have an option, because you know, this is what the Labour Party wanted. You know? They wanted people working in the NHS to concentrate on the NHS. So, so I had to sort of decide, I guess, that I could go along with that. And I had to take the party line. Uh, and, and that actually it didn't, it may not have been the route I was on, but actually let's see how we can, how we can work with that. Um, and it wasn't my decision at all, um, but we had to try and get the best result out of it. The, the, Did you make it clear to, when you were speaking with the consultants that it wasn't really your decision, that it was one that you were um, taking on uh, manfully, shall we say? Uh, well, yes and no is probably the answer to that, because actually once you... Because in a way you could say that might be a disarming way to go, but in another way it yeah. could have a fatal flaw in it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, well, you're either on side or you're not. I mean, if you if you're bought into the team, you're part of the team. Right. Um, and it's why, actually, one of the things about that book is that it's not full of gossip. I, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and indeed, I've had it criticised in the UK for it not being full of gossip. But, you know, gossip is ephemeral and, 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 and so on. Um, but actually, I, I, I bought in. So I'm saying to the doctors, this is what we're doing. You know, I'm, I'm not saying I disagree with it, but by the way, I've been told I've got to do it. You know, that's, that, that's, that, I'm, that, that's, just, that's just being wet, yeah. <laughs> if I put it in English, as it were. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we were going to do this. It yep. comes as a package. Um, the other sort of stuff that I needed to do, which were my decisions, were about how you organise the management. Now, um, the Prime Minister didn't, or, or, or the politicians didn't necessarily agree with the way in which I chose to do it, but those were the stuff that I had to persuade them that it wasn't daft that I was making sure that, you know, we had nurses in particular positions or, 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 or whatever. So we, we had those trade-offs. Um, but I think the most interesting uh, position is that we had to find ways to make strategic decisions that were 
robust uh, uh, and good. And let me, let me tell you about a particular strategic decision, which is that we were, we were putting more money into the NHS, we were doing lots of good things, and the NHS, it, 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 in any big change, it takes about two years before you start to see anything happen. Um, and after about two years, you began to see things shifting a bit. Um, but it wasn't shifting fast enough, and we had to find accelerants to, to make change happen. And one of the accelerants we, we chose uh, between us uh, was something that you'll be very familiar with in, in the US, is we introduced some private sector competition. Now this is radical, major strategic change. The NHS was um, a single payer, in, in US terms, and a single provider, essentially. Most of the provision was provided by NHS people or, or, people, or GPs who were very tied into the NHS. Um, we actually chose to introduce some private sector companies in to uh, provide a bit of challenge around elective surgery uh, and to start to make change. And this was really a major problem for the politicians and for me. For the politicians it was a major problem because the Labour Party hated it. Right? This isn't what they'd elected their politicians to do, to enable the private sector to make money out of the NHS. That's not where they were. And so they had a major political fight in that territory. And I had a major political fight with the NHS. Because the NHS said, we thought you were the chief executive of the NHS, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, why are you bringing in somebody who's going to do cataracts in somewhere uh, and, and, and um, you know, provide some competition for us? To which, you know, being properly brought into it, because I was part of the decision making, the argument was, um, actually, this is for patients. You know, we can see that this will actually make significant change. Um, uh, but it was a messy situation. Um, and it took some time, and it cost us some money. And like any major project, it was a real, uh, you know, it, it met obstacles, it ran into trouble, it, 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 we had big fights, it was about communication and, uh, and so on. But over time, we got to a position where actually the private sector input actually did help. It didn't help in terms of volume, really interesting. It helped in terms of uh, encouraging others to do things, you know. I reckon the first private sector lot we brought in probably did 14 operations in the first month. Yet the impact it had on change behaviour in the NHS was extraordinary. I had a graph of the waiting list coming down. It was coming down, you know, at sort of, you know, that sort of angle. And then it went down like that. And that was the point we introduced private sector competition. Everybody else changed their behaviour. So really interesting sort of set of issues. But it was a, it was a difficult decision because actually we were, again, in a sense, placing a bet. We believe this is, that, that something like this would happen. One of the mm. uh, points you're making uh, mm. in, in each of these examples is that uh, a decision is not a moment in time, is it? It yeah. is a process of understanding and, and learning or being told what mm. the dynamics are. Yeah. And there is a decision that is um, placed before you, which you may need to reshape or not. And mm. then it is a long process mm. of how you go about implementing it, yep. modifying it, evaluating it, actually defending it in ways that will allow for sustainability of a yeah. process to take its time. Yeah. And uh, this is the, I think, when we talk about um, leadership, we, we don't often use the word uh, stamina or constancy mm. yeah. of pur purpose, but there is an aspect of being a leader which um, has a, a component of indefatigability. You, you have to be um, there for quite a mm. long haul. Yeah. Uh, I can feel it in how you're talking. Uh, yeah. there, I know that there are a number of questions that may mm. relate to the NHS or may relate to larger, larger issues of leadership. And we are <coughs> going to get to his book from before the NHS that is turning <coughs> the world upside down. I'll be asking some questions about this. Um, but if you were going to that book, that's fine as well, because I know some of you are aware of, of how profound that is. Um, but I would like to see, hear from a couple of you if you have a question. Yes, please. Yeah. In the front. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Christina Papernik, and I am a second year master's student in the health policy and management program. Um, and a lot of our time we spend talking about how to make policy politically viable, mm. which as you all know is a big problem in the U.S. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the NHS historically and how it became 
the type of institution that it is today. Yeah. So could you, when you say how to make policy politically viable, you mean um, why was the NHS even ex uh, accepted when it first came into being? What was the political context there? And then probably if I hear where you're heading, you're wondering about the bump about privatization that Lord Crisp introduced. And now the third part of your question, I think, is that there's a very big bump going on now. Um, and you touched on it when you just started in terms of the new emphasis. So there's sort of three places. Okay. You may have four in your head, but. Yeah, OK. I mean, I mean without getting into yeah. a, a great deal of history, the NHS came out of the war. Um, you look at Africa, you look at India, you look at China today, and people are in the same sort of point where actually it's about nation building. You know? and, and it was very much for us. Um, we created the welfare state in the, in the 1940s, and it was you know people who'd, who'd won a war coming back and expecting much better things and a changed society from a deeply hierarchical society to one where um, the working man um, you know, got um, uh, support uh, for their life as opposed to the much more hierarchical society uh, that, that we had. So that's the whole ethos. Um, and the doctors voted against it, of course. <laughs> they didn't like it. Um, but anyway, uh, they carried on. It was about political will. Um, people loved it, you know. Not having that fear of when you go, if you come ill, that you might go bankrupt, that you might, you know, the breadwinner's ill, what happens to the family? You look all around the world. I think you look at this sometimes in the US, but I see this in, in Africa and India. The breadwinner's ill, you're in real trouble. Um, uh, 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 and relieving people of that pressure. So that's where it came from. And it drove on um, for a long time without reform, actually. Um, there was always some political tension around it because um, basically the right didn't really like it, but they recognized the public liked it and the left loved it and over-idolized it and set it in stone. And that's why we needed to reform it. Um, and we got to that point where actually, much as we all loved the NHS, uh, my, my Secretary of State at the time, it was the second one, I, another interesting point about politics, I had three Secretary of State, three bosses, health bosses in six years. Because um, you know the permanent secretary is this chief civil servant, so the political appointee is above him. Yeah, so there's a, polit there's a political appointment who's in the cabinet and then there's the chief civil servant, but I also happen to be the chief of the NHS as well, the two, two, two jobs combined. Um, but my, my second, permanent, uh, second Secretary of State, John Reid, had a wonderful expression. He said, in 1948, you know, or it, you know, you could have any colour of car you wanted as long as it was black. You know the famous, the famous saying. And that was great then, but by 1998, that wasn't any good. You need to choose your colour. You need to choose, you know, the shape of the ashtrays. You know, you, 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 uh, and that's the same with health. And his point was that we created an NHS which was any colour but black in 1948, and it didn't change enough. So you really need to change it and to and to get into mass consumerization or whatever the jargon is. Um, and that's where introducing the, pri the, the private sector helped us to sort of shift that, to, to break down some of our mindset. And it was very tough and it was very brave of the politicians. You know? It was a relatively easy decision for me. In fact, I got into trouble the year before by suggesting it. <laughs> and my Secretary of State criticized me in public for, for, for suggesting it. But in fact, we did it a, 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 a year later. Um, and so it was a tough political fight, but actually, I think it's less of an issue now. But what's happening at the moment is that the current government has, has, has not, in my view, and I've said this in the House of Lords, has not grasped the real issue. They, they, they've missed an opportunity. The real issue is that unless you sort out people with chronic health conditions, unless you provide a service that works for people with two or three uh, chronic health conditions, probably older people, who need a lot of care, they, they care from their friends and their family, and they, they care in the community, they will need occasional care in hospital when they acute, fall into acute people, they'll need rehab. Have. Unless you've sought out that, um, the NHS will go bankrupt, and you'll provide a lousy service for your patients. But what, we've, what they've done is, introduce, is, is to pick up two levers. They've continued with this introduction of the private sector, um, which is fine, useful lever, but not, you know, the market's not going to sort out healthcare. Um, why should it? There's no evidence of it ever doing so anywhere else. Um, uh, and to give the money to the GPs, which actually, again, has some sense to it, you know, so, so that actually our system is, we now pay our GPs, our family doctors, more than we pay our hospital specialists. You know? Very clear 
slightly accidental policy. It was deliberate, but it, we, we paid them too much, let me be clear. Um, but we wanted to raise the status. We wanted to be clear, actually, that, that actually primary care and community is where it's at. As I say, we got stuck in a negotiation, which meant that we paid them too much. Um, but it was the right direction to go in. Um, and they buy services from hospitals. Um, now, again, that's, that's useful, but neither of those two things give you the strategic direction that has to be faced up to, that some of the hospitals in the UK are going to have to close, some of the money out of that infrastructure is going to have to go into community infrastructure, and I don't think the market and GPs will be able to do that. I think you need some leadership and some other structures as well. And the government has ducked the issue. This opens up the thought of... Um the sort of structure and pyramid of healthcare that you addressed in um, your earlier book, uh, Turning the World Upside Down, the mm. global um, health for the 21st century. The, uh, the notion that uh, we have much to learn from the developing world about mm. how they are distributing health resources and how they are organizing the ways in which they engage with families and communities. Uh, and um, reciprocally, or at least in parallel, perhaps not reciprocally, this issue of the transfer of relative resources. Mm. Um, and could we, could we pivot to that, and um, could I ask you to frame the, the sort of fundamental argument of that book? Because this is something that will be of particular interest to this, this school. Many of us are engaged in global health in terms of thinking, writing, future careers. Many of us come from the developing world. Uh, yeah. So how does... W w well, let, 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 let me do that and also just pick up the, the sort of decision-making point there, which I think is, is, is interesting. Um, the basic premise of the book is that there's a lot the rich world can learn from the poor world, if I use terribly loose language, um, and that um, actually if you can get the innovation and the excitement and the, and, and the, and, and the knowledge from both or every part of the world linked together, then you can actually make some really good changes. I mean, we, we in, in Europe and North America and in, in the West um, have got fantastic science, have got fantastic training, have got fantastic um, uh, you know, use of technology, a whole lot of stuff that you really want. Um, but actually, if you look at some of the communities that I've been with, in, in, whether in Bangladesh or in India or in Africa, you can also see that they are much better than we are at engaging the community. Um, in healthcare and, and activating the community to, to do things, because partly because there isn't anything there. Um, uh, they actually train people rather differently. You, you have these really challenging things, like the experience in Mozambique of um, almost all the, 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 the caesarean sections, C-sections you call them, aren't they, are, are, are done uh, in, outside the capital, are done by nurses with a bit of additional training. They do them as successfully, i.e. with as few complications, and at about half the cost of doctors. Now that's really challenging to us, isn't it? Um, it challenges some of our thoughts about how we've structured and, and, and thought about the world. Now, um, you can't just pull that back and say, any more than you can take the practices from, from Mass General and take them and put them in, in rural Mozambique, you can't do it the other way around either. Um, but actually, by engaging people and thinking through these issues with them, you can start to move both sets of minds. So that's the sort of real, uh, the, 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 the real point about the book, is that we can both learn from each other. And actually, we'd better stop patronizing um, and assuming that because we've got the power and the money. That takes you to the second point, which I think you were thinking of the transfer of resources. Um, uh, I, I noticed today that the president of the World Bank has is, is, is announced his resignation, hasn't he? So we're going to have a good thumping row about who gets to nominate the next president of the World Bank because of the shift of power that we are seeing around the world. We're now getting to the state, aren't we, where, where the, 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 big, um, uh, the big global institutions of health, um, who controls them, how power is organized within them, are going to shift. And, we're, uh, and that's going to be a very uncomfortable process. Um, and the more open and, and the more discussion there is around that, I mean, I can see that you know countries are going to come at it with their own individual interests because they're bound to. But you know, how's that going to how's that going to work? And I think that will be a really interesting mm -hmm. uh, theme for the next ten years, won't it? it indeed. I mean, the, the World Bank presidency is it sort of crystallizes mm. uh, much of what. Could happen with healthcare since they're major funders uh, and strategists. Uh, what uh, questions 
I know there are a few here that are working in global health, uh, community work, resource transfers. Um, who would like to ask a question in, in that regard? Or if you'd like to go back to leadership strategies for healthcare, great, go ahead. Mm -hmm. My name is Aquila Ablor. I'm a second year doctoral student in epidemiology. My question is actually about that um, transition from, I'm not sure what the appropriate euphemism is, but maybe the developing to the more developed world. So um, how does the NHS or even um, maybe the United States in the future address the political um, fallout they might encounter if uh, they want to provide services for people who are not part of the system, the, the type of people who would slip through the cracks. For example, illegal immigrants. Well, we have that issue in the UK as well, but um, it's such a different context between the NHS and, 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 and the US. Um, if somebody comes into a hospital, in, 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 the, the, the two differences, uh, sorry, the one difference is, is that everyone is entitled to, be, to have a family doctor, to have a GP, and to be on a GP's list. And once they're in that system, to be referred anywhere within the system. And we have particular uh, arrangements for refugees. So it does depend what quite, there are refugees, there are illegal immigrants, there are people who've applied for refugee status and failed to get refugee status. There's a whole lot of different categories. And we have tried to specify what people are entitled to um, within, that set of, uh, within that set of categories. But the second thing about the NHS is because we don't police that, you know. When you, when you come in, you, you, you don't have to produce anything. Um, you know, uh, actually if you register with a GP you do, but if you come into hospital, you, you, you know, you say who you are and, 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 and you're treated within the system. There are, you, nobody's checking out whether your insurance will cover you for this, that or the other. Um, that's just not part of the system. So it's a very different circumstance. Now, you can well imagine that British, some British citizens um, get really annoyed at the thought of foreigners coming in and, uh, and, and taking resources. So we do need to be a bit cleverer about that and, and make sure that people aren't just coming in. But, but, but I did observe in my time uh, uh, in the NHS that um, our mental hospitals had an awful lot of uh, victims of torture in them. Our mental health services had an awful lot of people coming in from, uh, from Africa and elsewhere. Um, uh, a disproportionate amount. But actually, in a way, I think the people in the NHS felt that was fair enough. You know? it's, a, it's, a, it's a different sort of ethos. People didn't have to sort of make money out of it in quite the, or, or account for it in quite the same sort of way. Now, I think that's all tightening up. But that's the broad uh, UK position of, of, of constantly sort of um, uh, trying to maintain a position of being as open as possible to the world, but actually also saying, you know, we do have to have some categories of, of people. And I couldn't answer on the US. I, I have no idea how you, how, how, how you handle that within that context. But it's a big political argument, you know, because people will actually raise this. They'll say, all those people who come here. And then you look at the numbers, and in terms of the numbers, we spend 110, we spend $160 billion a year. Big organization. Um, uh, in terms of the numbers and the amounts, it's actually fairly small numbers within that. It's it, not quite a rounding error, but it's, it, it's that sort of territory. Um, How, yes, please. Question here, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm Sophia Penning. I'm also in the Health Policy Management uh, two-year master's. Mm. And you alluded to the importance of the people that you surround yourself with when uh, implementing a lot of these initiatives and yeah. change. And so my question is really, what, when you get into a position uh, or a new job, how do you think through the process of selecting your team, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you are tasked with really changing the culture and the dynamic of the organization? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm going to pick it up in, in, in two ways. I mean, the first one is you arrive and there's people in post. You know, it's not only organization, so there's people in post. So you have to make some judgments uh, uh, about people in post. Um, and you have, to, uh, you have to also work out, I, I think I said earlier, that, that you've got to work out what only you can do. You know, what are the bits that only you can do? What are the decisions that only you can do? and then make sure that you've got people around you who can do some of the rest. Um, I have a sort of 
shape of mind that is fairly strategic and, and big picture. I needed a guy, and tell you his name, John Bacon, um, who was focused, detailed, and he and I made a fantastic uh, um, dual act in that, you know, I would do the big picture and John would get fed up with me doing the big picture. <laughs> and say, let's get down to detail, you know? Uh, and I'd say, John, let's do that and then let's make sure that it's fitting to the bigger pattern. So, you know, there is a bit here about a team dynamic. Um, let me widen that out a bit because something I didn't mention earlier is, is something which I call a coalition of leadership. You're all going to be engaged or already engaged in, in organizations where power isn't in one place. Yeah? It's with the politicians, it's with the doctors, it's with the staff organizations, it's with the patients perhaps, hopefully one day. <laughs> it's with a whole range of people. So how do you create a coalition around you, not just the people you employ? Um, and, and we very carefully uh, tried to bring people into contact and discussion with us. And I say we because I'm, you know, it's not just a single person's job. Um, so that we actually had around the top table enough people who could represent slightly different perspectives uh, and so on. And actually, during the successful years for our change, which was between two, nine, 2002 and 2005, there was at the top of the NHS nine people who were what I regarded as the leadership coalition. It was the Prime Minister, and it was me. Uh, it was the Secretary of State, the Minister. It was their advisors, and it was my two um, people. Uh, and I had two. I had a left hand and a right hand. I had John Bacon, who was the guy who was the tough, detailed guy. And I also had, on, on, on the other side of me, I had a very developmental guy. Somebody who used, those of you who know, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement here, used IHI methodologies for about improvement. It was two-handed. Tough holding to account. Developmental. Uh, and those two pulled together. And, I, and the nine of us stayed in post for those three years. And that's another important point, actually. You can't keep chopping and changing. Three years isn't very long. But while those nine were in, pay, in place, we knew how to make decisions between us. It had sort of evolved. Um, and then came, along came an election, and the Prime Minister, in his wisdom, changed all the politicians. <laughs> so in the end, there was him, me, and another couple. Uh, and, and all the politicians in between had changed. And then the Prime Minister went the following year. Um, uh, and, and, you know, but that was an interesting example of political decision making. It wouldn't, wouldn't have been what I would have done. You know? I, you know, if this was working, I would have maintained some continuity. But that notion of a leadership community, I think, is really quite uh, a leadership coalition. And it is a coalition. You're not all on the same side. You know? <clears throat> Just one point, and then I'll, I'll, I'll call on you. Um, one uh, aspect of what Lord Chris just said is that he knew that he was a high-level strategic guy, and he chose someone who was more detail-oriented. Um, quick response, because then I'd like there are two questions here. Yeah, sure. Wouldn't you say, you can disagree with me, but it seems as if you are heading down this path, that to be a very good leader, you also have to know some very relevant aspects about yourself. Yeah, totally. Totally. You need, um, you're absolutely right. The most important thing you can get is, is feedback. So you learn how to handle what you've got, which is you. Um, and it's very hard as a leader. Nobody tells you the truth. More senior you get, less people tell you the truth. I'm sure you all tell the dean the truth. But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but they either try and bullshit you, if I can put it like that, and, and sell you something, or they tell you you're doing an awful job and attack you. you know? So you've got to find people around you to, to tell you the truth. But it's absolutely right. And the, and the other side of that is that the hardest decision that you ever make is to sack a friend. You know, if we go back to the decision-making theme, I remember one person who, whom I ended up having to move on who was good. He was good, really good. He was a great guy, but he wasn't good enough, in my judgment. I think I was right, but it was a really difficult decision. And, and it's those personnel decisions which are actually the, the ones that hurt and are hardest and stay with you more yeah. than some of the others in my experience. It's mm. very important. Yes, mm. please. I see several hands. So we will, if uh, we have time, but if. if Crisp question, crisp response, and we will get many of you. Hi, my name is Ann Kim, and I'm a two-year master's student in health policy and management on the policy track. I'm curious, during your years at NHS, um, what coalitions you formed with other um, agencies such as DEFRA in order to improve health outcomes, and um, what potential you see for the NHS to further that, especially as we engage in um, adaptations and uh, um, uh, preparations for climate change? 
Do you want to take the questions and then, I, or should I answer it quickly? Uh, I can't see how you're going to answer that one very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, so, but that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. So, with climate change coming in at the end, so that's the focus of this. Okay. Um, yes, sir. My name is Nathan Panwani, and I'm a, a MPH student in healthcare policy and management. You mentioned a coalition of leaders, and you mentioned the prime minister. And I'm reading Tony Blair's autobiography, All and right. he talks about how he was a um, he represents the, the third way approach to politics, moved his Labour Party away from its hard left roots towards the center, and uh, in some ways David Cameron is now doing a lot of the same tactics with his Conservative mm. Party, moving that to the center. And how do you think that third way approach to politics is going to influence uh, British health care policy into the future? Uh, you, let's not ask for a third question at the moment because those are both f fairly substantial. I'll give you a crisp answer, shall I? Yes. <laughs> yeah. On the first one, the short answer is not enough. Um, but we were engaged in trying to save the NHS. And to save the NHS, there was stuff that had to be done short term. And it was, it was about sorting out our accident emergency department, it was sorting out long waits, it was actually improving survival rates from cancer and coronary heart disease. Um, we had then what I called uh, the waiting list dividend. Once we got the waiting list down, you could then concentrate a bit more on some of the longer term. And that's what we should be doing now. And to the current government's credit, they are actually trying to do some of that. They are actually trying to recognise that you know, if you're going to sort out obesity, you've got to do something about the food manufacturers, you know, you, 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 climate change. Uh, the, li the linkages, are, they're, they've got quite some good things with climate change across government. You know, there's people responsible in each department for, for, for working with it. Um, but it's a longer answer, <laughs> but, but not enough in those days, but you've got to get to it. Um, the, 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 the other point about the politics, I think the, 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 the point that you make about Blair taking on the old guard was the point about, you know, classic example of this was introducing the private sector. Um, in, in, into healthcare, absolutely classic. Um, the centre ground. I mean, argue, I mean, what the current government is arguing, and, and this is all. Uh, this is all. I, I mean, I suspect this is just this year or two. I don't know how how, how important this will be as a sort of long term consideration. Is but they're arguing that all they're doing with the current NHS is continuing what Mr. Blair did um, with the with, with the NHS in, in two thousand. My argument is, in 2000, we were trying to deal with last century's problem. We need to be dealing with this century's problem, so they need to move on further than that. Um, but in, on the political side, people will argue that you can only win British elections from the centre. So there will be some, some common ground. What we've got to do as health professionals is get into the heads of the politicians that long-term conditions, non-communicable diseases, community-based services as opposed to hospital services is what the future is, and that they shouldn't be afraid of it and that actually the public are probably ahead of them. The public probably understand that better than I think the politicians, but they're terrified of closing hospitals. So are your politicians, I'm sure. Mm, yes, no, mm. this is a familiar yeah. theme, transiently said. There mm. is a, yes, sir. Hi. Let's wait for a microphone, Gary. Right. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name's Martin Reedy. I'm a first year master's student in the Society of Human Development and Health Program. I just had a question. I, I'm very familiar with Nicholas Kristof's book, Half the Sky, and it yeah. kind of talks about a lot of the same mm. issues you discuss mm. in mm. turning the world upside down. But if you could come to the States and sit down with our own policymakers, <laughs> what, what are a couple of the key lessons you'd like to take from your own writings and say, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share this with you because I think there's some other things out there in the world that you might benefit from? Um. I, I think there'd, there'd, there'd be a few. Um, I think, um, I, I, I was talking to some people yesterday about this, and it seems to me, are the, are the levers in, in change in your country going to come from the states rather than from the federal area? The, the, you know, I mean, I, I see some of your states actually making more significant change. That means it's going to be much more patchy, but, but maybe um, to give as much focus to, to, to states and people buying into uh, their, their, their responsibility. I don't quite know how the federal and the state works on this, but, but, but I would have thought there was, there, there was quite a, a strong leverage there. I would also think there was something about whom does it matter that your healthcare system isn't working? Um, and one answer to that is the poor or poorer people, but actually they're, they haven't got any power. They haven't got significant power, have they? So the other group to whom I think it matters 
is the payers, and I don't mean the insurers. I mean Ford Motor Company and Pepsi-Cola and, and, and whoever else you have, Walmart, and, and all the kind of people who actually end up paying for you. So I guess I would be saying, who's got, the, who, who's got in place of what we had, which was the real political will, because we're quite centralised, we had political will, the Prime Minister could decide he was going to do this, he could appoint me, I could get on with it, and, and I could you, you know, use a lot, of, a lot of straightforward power, actually. And you can't do that in the States because that's not how you're structured and it's not how you're culturally structured. So who, who's who got that interest who, to, to provide that sort of will? And I wonder whether it isn't some coalitions around some of those people and this notion of a coalition of people trying to change things, get people on side and, and get them moving. And, and, and they need to be people who have more power than I suspect the people who are disenfranchised in your country um, are. That would be just a couple of my observations. I'd also do something about your staffing structures, but that would be a, uh, a more complex position. We all spend too much, don't we, in, in high staffing structures when actually we could get stuff done by people who were not trained to the same extent, and we could do them at better, uh, the same levels of quality thanks to if you've got appropriate supervision and you've got new technology. You know, I, mean, I think that's a very big one. Um, but um, I wouldn't do that first. Well, I mean, but that links to the, the large global discussion about the health professionals for the 21st century. Yeah. I know you've done a lot of thinking about that. It is um, work that we're familiar with, uh, and it would be very interesting to hear from you, uh, both in the context you just said for the U.S., reforms in the NHS, and then also the <coughs> developing world, what you think we collectively as a global health community should be aiming to introduce in terms of new kinds of paraprofessionals, stances we should be taking when we go overseas and work in other settings, um, as teachers and schools here, who should we be recruiting, what sorts of distribution of, of goods and skills do you think need to be um, a sort of foregrounded as uh, what we need to be helping the world accomplish? Mm. Well, first of all, Supposing me... you were the new head of the World Bank. <laughs> Uh, th th let me first of all um, give a um, advertisement or whatever is the right word for your dean's work on, uh, on, on this. As, as you will probably know, that um, your dean, together with Lincoln Chen, chaired um, a task force on a commission on professionals for the 21st century, of which I was privileged to be to be a member. Uh, and I think what that did was to sketch out the areas where change is already happening, because actually, interestingly. The chain, some of the most dynamic change, isn't going to come from this country or from the UK. I mean, it's for all the reasons that we've just talked about. And that piece of work did try and identify where people were pushing the boundary out in all kinds of different ways uh, and starting to shift it. I also think it did, uh, if I just mentioned two other things from it that I think are very salient to the point here. Um, uh, the first one is that it talked about health professionals as being change agents. Yeah? So you're not because you've achieved the great status of being a consultant or attending cardiologist, the world hasn't stopped. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not all set in stone and you don't, you know, you, you, you just follow on where your predecessor was and everyone does what they're told and you, and, and, you, and you carry on, rather in the way that it felt like it did in the NHS in 1980. Um, uh, but actually, your responsibility is, as a professional is to wield a team and to and to make change happen and, and, and to constantly be challenging and moving the boundary on. Am I getting this about right, Dean? <laughs> uh, the other thing that I think came out of that very interestingly is there's a million health professionals graduating every year in the world. Think what could be done with you know, social networking, methodologies, linking people together if actually thinking about ch what that group of people, many of whom are you know, eventually in, the, in this room, graduating the last four, four or five years, what, what the changes you could make together. This is very big numbers of people and, and, and learning around the room. So I, I think there's an awful lot in that linkages of people that will actually make very significant change happen. That's optimistically. Well, we, we need optimism, don't we? <clears throat> I mean, there's much in this room, but um, leaders need fundamentally mm -hmm. a sense of yeah. optimism and a vision, which you have just sketched out. We have um, a short time, and I would very much like you to um, have the last word, however you would like to frame this, in, in terms of your sense of your um, instruction to us about leadership, 
um, how you would address any group of students and young professionals who are heading out into healthcare, um, largely conceived. Uh, what's it been like for you um, hmm. at, at the head of so many important initiatives and making such important changes? Well, it's been both terrific and hard. You, you, you mentioned somewhere about the need for grit and determination and stamina because it doesn't work first time. It doesn't work fourth time. You know, you, you, you know, you're making improvement one patient at a time. You know, when we were bringing down the waiting list, my chief executives um, knew that I wanted them to know which patients had been waiting longer and why they had been waiting longer. You know, there, there's a bit of detail here which is actually really rather important. And you can be in these brilliant academic centres and you can design stuff that sounds wonderful. But actually, when it hits reality, the, the, there's a big thing about, about just con continuing, about stubbornness, about, uh, and, uh, and about the biggest problem for chief executives, which is lack of self-confidence. You may not appreciate that, but any number of chief executives I've talked to have, a, have had crises of confidence, because you you're the only one. And actually, you don't have to be a chief executive of a socking big organisation to feel that. You just need to be a leader of a team that actually sometimes... Uh, and one of the things that I have, have learned uh, and have been very grateful for is to ask for help when I need it. Yeah? Really important. I, when I was running the, the NHS, I had 600 organisations accounting to me, 600 chief execs. Um, and I could see the ones that failed. The ones that failed is when things started to go wrong. They went into siege mentality. You know, they, they, they hid in their office and they, and they tried to think their way out of the box. The ones who succeeded, because everyone's got problems, because you, you can bet <laughs> uh, that there will be problems to pick up. The people who succeeded were very often the ones who, when faced with that problem, found somebody to work it through with. You know? And I don't mean a buddy. I actually mean they went and found somebody who solved that problem. They, they said, actually, I don't know what the answer is. Let's see if we can find it. And I think that's a very big thing which actually keeps you vibrant and alive. If my final word is that I, I say in the book that um, I, I had this awful week which started on Monday in Whitehall and uh, the first thing I did on Monday morning was meet my Secretary of State so that we could uh, talk about what each other were doing during the week and then I spent three or four days in, um, uh, in Whitehall and, and, and dealing with the sort of grind of, uh, uh, of politics but policy making and uh, and, and, you know, having to pay attention to what the media was doing and all that. And on Fridays, I used to walk around the NHS. I used to, I think 30 times a year is probably what I managed out of, you know, 52 Fridays, is I'd get out into a hospital, I'd get out into primary care, I'd go around, I'd remember why I was there, and I'd get refreshed from that. And if you're a leader, you need to get that refreshing uh, and that, that connection back down to, to, to what it's about. And people challenge you. But actually, the really sad thing was that... Um, People said, thank you for coming, you know? <laughs> you know? I, I, people will recognize that, you know? You, you come along and you, and you ask people what they're doing and they, and they, and they tell you and, and, and so on and you think, you know, we're, we're trying to make this thing better and I know that part of the time it's making it harder for people as we, as we make these changes and they say, thank you for coming and talking to us. And it's a really humbling, humbling bit, but it's also, for me, it was my therapy. Frankly, you know, it was it was it was what kept me going, and so I think there is a big bit. You know, th there will be different sorts of leaders. There will be different people who do it in different ways. But I think for many people, making sure that you don't think leadership is a one-person job, um, uh, making sure that you're constantly learning and 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 you're not going into a shutdown mode, um, seem to me to be very important. You know, when we're thinking about leaders for healthcare who are dealing with patients and professionals and then the general public. A leader who is not humane and generous and wise and steadfast uh, will be identifiable quite quickly. And one who is, who has the traits that we've seen today, is going to be renowned. Let's thank Lord Chris.